What a strange girl you are. Why? Flung out of space. Lesbian period pieces seem to be everywhere these days, as SNL recently parodied. New award-winning film, Lesbian Period Drama, starring two straight actresses who dare not to wear makeup. Since the release of 2015's Beloved Carol, there have been at least 15 other lesbian period films and several television shows, which is a lot when you consider there still aren't very many LGBTQIA stories made overall. So why do so many films about lesbians follow this very specific formula? Featuring Academy Award-winning glance choreography. <laughs> many of these films connect with viewers because they're beautifully filmed with a sophisticated art house aesthetic, and they offer a sense of empowerment to queer audiences who have rarely been able to see themselves represented in history. <laughs> At the same time, this trend also boils down to the impulse to copy films that have found an audience and are considered marketable. Lesbian period pieces almost always star white, straight actresses who have a strong mainstream fan base, and often end tragically, playing into rigid audience expectations about queer films. My guess is that it was diphtheria. No! <laughs> Here's our take on exactly why there are so many lesbian period pieces and why it's important not to get too stuck on any formula. If you're new here, be sure to subscribe and click the bell to be notified about all of our new videos. This video is brought to you by Mubi, a curated streaming service that takes the guesswork out of choosing what to watch next. Every day, Mubi premieres a new film, each one thoughtfully handpicked. Their team of curators is dedicated to introducing you to the best of cinema and exclusive gems you can't find anywhere else. Right now, Mubi is offering our viewers 30 days free. Click the link in the description below to start streaming now. So much is said about what they feel for one another in those tiny glances and in those very small touches, you know, she just... One of the most distinctive qualities of a lesbian period piece is the aesthetic. They tend to have many of the formal hallmarks of art house cinema, long takes and carefully framed static shots with slow paced editing, muted color palettes, dim lighting and limited dialogue. 12 lines of dialogue, two and a half hour runtime. They are undoubtedly beautiful films to look at, and that makes them popular among cinephiles, film festivals, and highbrow audiences. And now with Ammonite, he's absolutely delivered on that promise, crafting a beautifully textured, emotionally layered, and achingly moving love story. Thus, there's an incentive to continue crafting lesbian period pieces that fit this proven mold, as they win accolades and can be marketable to a specific audience that can yield profits on a modest budget. Aside from their arresting cinematography, though, these period pieces' aesthetics can tend to uphold certain more pernicious aspects of the entertainment industry's status quo through their focus on white, thin, feminine, cis women. Figured you're looking for this. Thanks, uh, Louise. The industry assumption that a white lesbian period piece is more marketable can mean that non-white lesbian films aren't given the budgets and support they need to reach audiences. Along with the overwhelming whiteness of most lesbian period pieces, they also spotlight a constrained, somewhat homogenous version of femininity. There may be something aesthetically pleasing about seeing two women quietly falling in love while dressed in several layers of restrictive clothing. But a love story between two feminine women doesn't truly disrupt the rigid standards of gender expression in the same way that depictions of more masculine-coded women can. Sure, these films take place in an era where gender divisions were, supposedly, even stricter than they are now. But throughout history, queer women have still presented at varying levels of masculine and feminine. Anne Lister was born in 1791 um, in Yorkshire, Halifax, and she was a diarist, a lesbian. She had a nickname, Gentleman Jack, because of how she looked and the rumours of what she did with women around the area. Using this delicate type of femininity as our only form of lesbian representation upholds an unrealistic standard of what an acceptable queer woman should look like. You are the most fascinating person there tonight, and I think the most beautiful. Notable exceptions to this rule include films like Colette and Elisa e. Marcella that depict how gender non-conforming people may have expressed themselves in the past. I never felt like I belonged, and then one day, I tried on my brother's school uniform. And that was it. I knew I was home for the first time. 
The insistence on upholding thin, white femininity also leads to the casting of well-known straight actresses in lesbian roles. Playing a character who has a relationship with a woman and feels great love for a woman, it was very new for me because I did see the role of a woman through completely different eyes. And though this may help the marketability of the film, many queer people feel that straight actors do not capture the authenticity of their experiences. This is true for LGBTQIA films across genres. Most recently, James Corden received backlash for his performance as a gay man in The Prom, which Eric Anderson of Awards Watch called gross, offensive, the worst gay face in a long time. We'll check out the Reba McIntyre collection at Kmart. We'll do a little fashion show. Some also fear that the casting of straight and cis actors in these roles leads to audience members subconsciously perceiving queerness as a temporary costume because they know that once the cameras turn off, these actresses are straight cis women. You know, I've been married for 18 years. A triumph of the lesbian period piece aesthetic is that it typically aims to avoid and challenge the male gaze. Women have been Im imagined by men, so they're in charge of our images. Um, still? Still, think? of course. It's certainly a draw of the genre for female audiences to see themselves represented on screen without being portrayed as sexual objects for a man, as is the overwhelming norm in mainstream media. A lesbian film that explicitly contests the legacy of the male gaze is Portrait of a Lady on Fire, which focuses on the female transformation from object to subject. We are at the same place. Exactly at the same place. If you look at me. However, while Portrait of a Lady on Fire was written and directed by a woman, Celine Sciamma, many lesbian films are still directed by men, a notorious example being Abdelatif Kashish's Blue is the Warmest Color. He wanted the, the, the sex scenes to be very sexual. That was his uh, wish. Jules Moreau, the author of the original graphic novel, has described the movie's graphic sex scenes as a brutal and surgical display of so-called lesbian sex, which turned into porn and made me feel very ill at ease. Among the only people we didn't hear giggling were the potential guys too busy feasting their eyes on an incarnation of their fantasies on screen. The author of the um, graphic novel, which inspired, very freely inspired it, she said, uh, uh, as a feminist and a lesbian spectator, I cannot endorse the direction because she took on these matters. Uh, there's also been an awful lot of stuff with the actors themselves saying that they had an incredibly hard time with the director. A more subtle problem with the accepted formula of the lesbian period piece is that it might allow straight audiences to believe that queer hardship is largely in the past. We expect, given the seriousness of the charges and the incontestability of the evidence, that the court will grant sole custody of the child to my client. The fact that some of the most obvious systemic and social obstacles presented in the movie have been overcome may inadvertently let audiences minimize the challenges that queer people still face today. Lesbian period pieces are most often associated with one type of narrative, tragedy. Just promise me something. Go right to me. Don't look for me. This is due to the expectations audiences bring to the genre. The audience walks into the theater knowing that these women will likely not end up together. I want this to be different, our different. This must make your husband very happy. Because it's automatically assumed that the past was strikingly more homophobic and sexist than the present, tragedy might feel like both the natural and accurate ending to these films. But the association between on-screen queer romance and unhappiness can be traced back to the Hayes Code, which from the 30s through the 60s included queerness in its forbidding of, quote, sex perversion and its guidance that any, quote, sin shouldn't be framed with sympathy. And the loose idea that being queer must be answered with some form of misery outlasted strict implementations of the code itself. I rush into the secret house. The Children's Hour, released in 1961 as the code's dominance was reigning, was able to tell a surprisingly empathetic queer story for its time, but this still had to end with a brutal, self-inflicted tragedy. Even in very recent TV examples, the bury your gaze trope has persisted, with writers frequently killing off queer characters to motivate a straight character's journey. We commit Catherine Abiki Mackenzie Dawson to a natural end. 
In the post Hayes Code era, depictions of explicitly queer characters' struggles actually served an important purpose. When the mainstream mindset was still overwhelmingly homophobic, tragic endings harnessed empathy for queer characters and humanized people that were deeply othered. She's the only person who ever loved me, you know? I think I'll die without her. Yet as society continues to progress, many people are looking for depictions of queer joy instead of, or in addition to, queer struggle. Carol resonates so strongly with viewers in part because it was adapted from a novel often considered to be the first ever lesbian book with a happy ending. And while the film's conclusion may not be spelled out, based on the way Carol and Therese smile at each other in the final moments, the viewer is encouraged to believe they get back together. Even when historic pieces may not always allow for traditional happy endings, films can still resolve on a hopeful note. Portrait of a Lady on Fire recognizes that its two main characters can't end up together in their society. Vous imaginez mon plaisir? C'est une façon de ne pas espérer. But concludes with the emotional closure of reinforcing the meaningfulness of their time together. As Marianne watches Eloise become overcome with emotion while hearing the song that Marianne once played for her, this ending suggests that their relationship will forever be so precious to each of them that it's ultimately worth the heartbreak. The success of these films prove that happy queer endings are not only possible, they are desperately wanted. Though there are surely more bottom line economic reasons why lesbian period pieces keep getting made, we also need to look at the positive reasons why audiences are responding to them. You're an exploding star, refracting light across the universe. Certainly, many fans of these films are lesbian or queer themselves, and it's easy to see why they're drawn to these narratives. What is it you want? Another 40 minutes with you. Queer women are often forgotten and erased by history. The legend goes that Queen Victoria was unable to imagine lesbian sex, though it's more likely that a desire not to draw attention to it was behind applying Britain's anti-homosexuality law only to men, and simultaneously writing lesbians out of legal history. Between men, it's illegal, it's a criminal act. Between women, it isn't, so it isn't. Queerness is not a modern creation. It has long existed in many different forms and contexts. I love and only love the fairer sex. But it may be difficult to find evidence of it in history books. It's pretty rare that a period piece is not adapted from a, a book or uh, an historical um, event. This great love story between two women in the 18th century, it's not written, so you have to write it. These films or series can expand our historical imaginations, and today's most well-received lesbian period pieces are often the ones most boldly reimagining history for themselves. The favorite takes place during the 17th century, but prioritizes modern storytelling and self-aware humor over surface accuracy. You're so beautiful. Stop it, I, you mock me. I do not. If I were a man, I would ravish you. Dickinson is another example that presents the past in a playful, at times fantastical light, and uses contemporary music and dialogue to make the history relatable for today's viewer. I like big boys, itty bitty boys, Mississippi boys, and the city boys. There is something incredibly affirming about seeing yourself represented in history, particularly when this history has been hidden or ignored for so long. When these films are viewed together as part of a larger canon, they provide a powerful sense of queer longevity, allowing us to feel a sense of community with and connection to the past. I feel terribly real right now. A downside of this picture, though, is that this representative history has yet to be extended to queer women of color in a meaningful way. So while we can celebrate the progress being made within the period piece genre, we must also work toward giving more people the opportunity to retell their histories. The phenomenon of the lesbian period piece tells us a lot about how expectations shape which films get made. Many audiences like to know what to expect from a film, and filmmakers count on tried and true tropes in order to sell their films. There is a particular comfort that audiences get from knowing what they'll get from an entry in this particular subgenre. It will be beautiful, women will cry in dramatic outfits, and someone will have their heart broken. I wish you told me before. Could have saved the boat there. Mary, Mary. 
With the film industry in constant fear of losing money, studios aren't eager to take any risks on producing new stories or styles. Ironically, though, new stories are exactly what fans of this genre, and arguably all genres, want. With movies like The Favorite and Summerland, or TV shows like Dickinson leading the way, we can imagine a whole new type of lesbian period piece and LGBTQ plus story in general. One that centers joy, playfulness, and limitless creativity. These films can be deeply affirming by proving to queer women of all backgrounds that their stories deserve to be told, and people are listening. I was born like this, and I act as my God-given nature dictates. This is The Take on your favorite movie shows and culture. Thank you so much for watching and for supporting us. Please subscribe and never miss a take. Thanks again to Mubi for sponsoring today's video. One film I highly recommend checking out is Alice and the Mayor. Mubi is presenting the exclusive streaming premiere of the award-winning film as part of their month-long can takeover, which showcases some of the best films to premiere at the festival in recent years. Other upcoming highlights from the program include Rungano Nyoni's I Am Not a Witch and Lav Diaz's The Halt. If you're anything like me, these days you may be totally uninspired and stuck when it comes to figuring out what to watch next. Subscribing to Mubi completely fixes that. Their team of curators handpicks every film they show, so there's always something new to discover. They seriously love movies as much as we do, so their recommendations are always top notch. As a special gift to our viewers, Mubi is offering 30 days free, so click the link in the description below to start streaming now.